Our third speaker this morning will be Frederick Verdonk from Arch Consulting, Belgium. Uh, Frederick has a background in probabilistic chemical risk assessment and this morning will be presenting to us on accounting for uncertainty under reach registration versus authorization decision making processes. Frederick, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as indicated, I will be talking about another piece of EU chemical legislation, being the REACH legislation, and this is under the auspices of another European agency, the European Chemicals Agency, or uh, ECHA. I will first shortly introduce the two processes, registration, authorization, and then I will be moving into how to account for uncertainty in the decision-making process, also trying to take an angle from what, what is expected from the guidance perspective, and then how it is actually done in practice. So first of all, to introduce to you, in a, the EU REACH regulation is a regulation that requires uh, manufacturers or uh, importers of chemical substances to register the substance. So it is important to note that it's a responsibility of the industry to run a first uh, chemical safety assessment or chemical risk assessment. And then in the next step, this is further evaluated by authorities. Also, yeah, and the, and the purpose of the registration process is basically to obtain market access. If your chemical is registered, you have market access. The authorization process is a little different process. The, the purpose here is mainly to phase out or ban uh, very dangerous uh, chemicals. Uh, but equally, the process is the same. There is an applicant, an industrial user that uses a certain chemical, needs to submit uh, some kind of risk assessment, and then it's further evaluated by the uh, authorities. Just to give you an idea, in the registration process of the past 15 uh, years, so a bit less than 22,000 chemicals were registered. So these are you know, daily chemicals, uh, sh uh, chemicals in shampoo, paint, detergents, uh, all the chemicals in your smartphone. It's very broad uh, legislation. Uh, so far, 5% of that is uh, evaluated. In the authorization process, the, the number of chemicals at stake is much smaller, so it's about 200 substances, and these are so-called substances of very high concern, so they are either carcinogenic, mutagenic, reprotoxic, or persistent bioaccumulative toxic, or have an equivalent uh, concern. Now, how risk assessment is conducted in REACH? Well, it's uh, the classical um, exposure assessment. Um, there is a hazard assessment, and then in a risk characterization, both are combined. The risk is not defined as a probability. It is rather a simple ratio of an exposure estimate and a, some kind of safe, safe threshold. Mm. Uh, the red arrow is also important because it's part of an uh, iterative approach, uh, it's a tiered approach. You usually start off with worst case assumptions and then, you know, if you identify your risk, you basically would go back and try to refine the assessment. Now, under the authorization, at least for non-threshold chemicals, so these are chemicals for which we cannot derive a safe limit, there are two additional um, steps. So because we cannot derive a safe limit, there is also a need to quantify the population impact. How many cancer cases can we expect by continuing to use a certain substance? And then an, another additional step is to monetize that uh, impact. So the little table here at the right corner um, gives some uh, reference willingness to pay values for you know, an additional cancer morbidity or internal birth defect and, and so on. Um, now, how is uncertainty accounted for in this process? Uh, as I said, it's uh, usually from a setting as a worst case scenario, worst case setting, so we have assessment factors, safety factors, we have conservative parameter values. For example, in the picture you can see a discharge either of a municipal sewage treatment plant or an industrial plant. By default, it's assumed that there is a dilution factor of 10. This is quite conservative because in reality, usually dilution is much uh, larger. But still, 10 is used you know, to calculate the uh, possible or exposure. There are also conservative assumptions like uh, 
Uh, there's a scenario where the local population living around this discharge, uh, their fish and seafood consumption is basically 100% coming from locally caught fish at that discharge point. Yeah? So in all these conservative assumptions are propagated into the final risk uh, estimate. So for a decision maker or authority, it's, it's a bit difficult to say from, based from the risk quotient or the risk ratio only how uncertain or is it a conservative assessment, is it an average assessment, is it overly protective, it's quite difficult to say. So even though on the input side of the risk assessment uncertainties are to some extent and in some cases very well described, the uncertainties are not propagated to the uh, risk characterization. Um, yeah, so the, the risk characterization is, as indicated here, just this risk ratio of exposure and no effect, and the, the uncertainty or the conservatism is somehow hidden and concealed in the numbers. And this is generally referred to as the uh, positivism uh, paradigm. And we know that uncertainty and risk are independent concepts. It's not because there is more uncertainty and more conservative assumptions are made that automatically the risk would also increase. We should separate those two concepts. And ECHA actually also developed a guidance on uncertainty analysis. And I have to say it's not as extensive as the EFSA one. It's also older than the EFSA one, but at least it also provides some first steps or ideas on how to, to run an uncertainty analysis in this context. And there are a couple of circumstances under which the uncertainty analysis is recommended, but I would like to point you to the, the second one, uh, because first of all, it's not a mandatory assessment, uh, it's optional. And one of the reasons why they would recommend to do uncertainty analysis is to justify uh, in case a non-standard or a non-guideline approach is used. So I, I was triggered by this because, of course, this somehow suggests that a standardized or a guideline approach um, has somehow less need for uncertainty. And we touched upon that uh, earlier this morning with some of the questions. Hmm? Um, in the authorization process, there is no real guidance on, on how to deal with uncertainty in that process. However, in the practical guide on how to apply for uh, authorization, there is a certain paragraph that recommends uh, the risk assessor to run a so-called central tendency scenario. So it means for all the parameters and all the assumptions that you make in your risk assessment, try to take an average and try to make, let's say, a more a, as realistic impact as possible. And the reason for this is because in the authorization process, which of course the risk assessment and authorization is very similar to the registration, but the big difference is that this is an impact assessment. And in the authorization, there is a so-called socioeconomic analysis where the uh, monetized risk is to be balanced against the cost for substituting a substance or non-use of the substance. So let's take, for example, uh, lead or lead compounds, which are or will be on the authorization list. Eh? If we are to, boldly speaking, ban lead from today to tomorrow, the majority of European cars would no longer drive because most of them have a lead acid battery. Eh? So there's clearly the socioeconomic impact that needs to be accounted for in the decision-making process. But the socioeconomists, when they calculate the impact, they would typically do an average uh, cost implication impact. So it doesn't make sense to compare an average uh, cost for society to a worst case monetized risk. And that's the reason why we should try to uh, est estimate a monetized risk more as a central tendency to compare uh, like with like. Um, what else is in the uncertainty analysis guidance? So there, the it is some kind of tiered approach which is also proposed. There is this level one qualitative uncertainty analysis. Then there is a next level, uh, which yeah, 
basically the, the requirement is to run two or three scenarios. If it's comparable, as I explained, you run an average scenario, and then you also run a worst case, and you could account for, you take into account aleatory and or epistemic uncertainty. And then the level three would be, you know, the more probabilistic one, of which we saw a lot of methods yesterday, and do a more thorough uh, uncertainty assessment. Um, I'm skipping the next two slides for the sake of, uh, of time. But this is what the guidance, and now, yeah, how is it a practice being used or not? And, uh, well, we have to be honest, it's not really used. Hmm? Uh, it's rarely done, and why is not? I've tried to put up a couple of reasons or hypotheses why this uncertainty analysis has not been, been uh, conducted. Uh, first of all, it's not mandatory. Uh, maybe another point is there is also limited recognition. Yeah? So in the, the standard template for doing risk assessment under the EU chemical reach legislation does not have a specific section, you know, uncertainty analysis that invites the risk assessor to put some, some uh, statements about that in the, in the conclusions. Or maybe it's just also because there is limited request from authorities, and I should explain this a bit more. Authorities do request, or member states do have concerns about uncertainties and conservatism, but they are usually focused at the input side of the risk assessment, and they want to make sure that if an uncertainty is identified, that you take some conservative assumption and then you propagate that conservative assumption to the risk conclusion. So there's not a lot of... Uh, um, request for actually having risk uh, conclusions together with uncertainty statements about that. Uh, also, maybe it's not a priority. Eh? Over the past 15 years, more than 20,000 chemicals were registered. Maybe we shouldn't be complaining that they haven't done an uncertainty analysis, but we should be glad that we have that 20,000 risk assessments conducted because they were not conducted before REACH. Eh? Um, also, it's a standardized methodology, eh? and there I'm a bit struggling myself as to how or whether uncertainty analysis is, is needed and, ha and how helpful it is for standardized uh, risk assessments, although I do have the feeling that it's, it can perhaps create some kind of overconfidence level in the assessment, because this was the way how it was always been done over the past uh, 20, 30 years. Hmm. Now, for the purpose of authorization, I, we do see now really a drive uh, to do more about this uncertainty assessment, given that in the socioeconomic analysis, we need to compare with the you know, societal costs for that. And that invites both the risk assessor and the decision maker to really fully understand what the, what the implications are and make a proper comparison. Also, the authorization process, um, there's at this point in time less than 200 substances, so it's maybe also more feasible to do a more thorough uh, uncertainty uh, analysis compared to, you know, more uh, standardized registration. So with this, I'd like to conclude that the um, reach registration and evaluation um, in, in this risk assessment process, uncertainty is still insufficiently made visible uh, to the decision makers, but rather it's hidden and concealed in the risk ratios because there's just this one worst case scenario which is uh, conducted, despite there is guidance on uncertainty analysis. Uh, as for the REACH authorization, I'd rather put a positive turn to see that this is really an opportunity uh, an opportunity for more explicit and transparent uncertainty analysis and communication. And then maybe as a last point, I've, I know I've taken a quite practical uh, you know, presentation from, from the practical field. Uh, um, I, I heard a lot of interesting presentations uh, yesterday and, uh, and I join your enthusiasm in, in developing and using these uh, uncertainty analysis methods given I've, I've done similar work in the past. But don't forget that implementation and involvement of the decision makers is very key in the, uh, in the overall process as you can appreciate from, from the REACH registration.
um, I, I still expect many years to come before it will actually uh, be implemented in the decision-making process. This was the end. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Frederic. Are there questions, please? At the back there, please. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. You focused very much on the registration, evaluation, and authorization, let's say, components in REACH. I would like to add a remark on the restriction side. We've just completed a structured review of 24 restriction dossiers that have been adopted, looking into the methodological approaches to do the socioeconomic analysis, including the impact assessment. So what we find is that if we go from risk information to impact information, there is a clear gap of transforming this on in environmental impacts, mm -hmm. particularly into yeah, values for decision making. So just adding one reason why uncertainties have not been taken up is just that there is a methodological gap to transform risk information into impacts, not even mm -hmm. talking about valuation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I fully agree with this. So I, I think that's the main challenge to, to make that transformation from risk into impact. But it's, I think the transformation from risk to impact is also a transformation from conservative to you know, realistic along with conservative and best and, and some kind boundary analysis. So I think that's part of the, the transformation, but I agree. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from the room? Please, Andy. Um, you, you suggested that uh, because the economic evaluations gave central estimates, that central estimates should also be taken from the risk to compare with them. Uh, I'm puzzled by that. I wonder. Why wouldn't it be better to take account of uncertainty in the economic evaluation as well as in the mm -hmm. risk evaluation? Yes, I, I would agree to that. That would be the most ideal situation that you do both the, the boundaries or the uncertainty analysis at the risk assessment side and the socioeconomic impact side. I, I totally agree. I'm just trying to sketch the current, the current situation and I do, I do think that in the socioeconomic analysis sometimes these this, uh, boundaries are also presented uh, but the, let's say the main outcome is the central tendency and then the, the, the other is additional information and that's different for the risk assessment where the main outcome used to be the worst case uh, and then everything else was additional information. Okay, Frederick, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.